managers and teams only engage superficially, superficially with the health and well-being area of learning experience, I ask the question, is it possible that they might perceive that this area of learning experience can be taught predominantly in the classroom? A scary thought. Next, I think there's a great effort being placed into the official translation of the curriculum into the Welsh language in Wales. However, given the different dialect and informal translation, I do wonder sometimes what impact this might have on the interpretation and sense making of P through the Welsh medium. In particular, for example, when translations in the informal Welsh are not always the same as in the English. And finally then, my final point is around the, in 2022, the Welsh curriculum will become a statutory requirement and hence all schools in Wales will be expected to adopt the six areas of learning and experience. However, at the moment, the delivery of initial teacher edu education and the PGC, at least in name, remains within the subject. So we've got a PGC PE programme. And I often wonder when might this transformation be reflected within the initial teacher education and PGC agenda. Thank you for listening today and we look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thanks Anna. And finally on to Rachel and Ollie. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, so my name is Ollie Hooper and with my colleague Rachel Sanford also from Loughborough University today we're going to talk a little bit about that English curriculum for you. So I'm going to start off um, now I'm aware that most people will have read over the curriculum briefly there's not an awful lot of it to read um, but to give you a bit of a background to that that national curriculum for PE in that English context so there are statutory programs of study for key stages one and two and three and four and across all of those key stages there are these four overarching aims that the subjects should seek to work towards and in those programs of study we see that subject content is outlined and there is also reference made to attainment um, although as we'll touch on later that's rather fleeting and a little brief if we think about the role of, of health in that PE curriculum or is it a, as a component of, of PE um, health has been associated with the PE curriculum in England since its inception um, and arguably with every subsequent iteration of that PE curriculum that position of health has been strengthened um, if we think about the current curriculum that we're working to now in England, health holds a fairly prominent position um, and it relates explicitly to two of those four overarching aims that I mentioned around ensuring that pupils are physically active for sustained periods of time and ensuring that pupils lead healthy, active lifestyles. If we think about that, that curriculum document, as I've mentioned already or alluded to already, if you've not read it, it is rather brief and the detail in it, I think it's fair to say it is somewhat limited. So that limited detail in that curriculum means that a lot of emphasis is placed on teachers' expertise to read, interpret, and then enact that curriculum using their professional judgment. But what that does mean then, that there is that potential, I guess, for some misinterpretation um, when they are trying to enact that curriculum document. It's important to bear in mind across all contexts, but I think especially so in the English context where the curriculum document is so brief, that they represent only one form of policy so there are these wider policies and, and wider strategies and initiatives that also influence practice within PE. And I think that's fair to say that they, they can be quite influential in the English context, at least. So things like a sporting future, a new strategy for an active nation, childhood obesity, a plan for action, and the school sport and activity action plan all influence that practice that goes on in that physical education context in England. And those policies serve to influence how teachers read, interpret, and then enact that curriculum, and also influence, I guess, the discourses that are promulgated through it. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Rachel, who's going to maybe share some of our thoughts around some critical considerations on the national curriculum. You are that I did say he needs to make the handover really clear because otherwise I'll be confused. So that was pretty good. Um, okay, hi everybody. Nice to, to join you all today. I must admit, I feel a little bit of a, a fraud because uh, Policy and curriculum isn't really my uh, research area, but I do like to ask a good question. So I was quite happy to engage in some kind of critical reflections around the curriculum. Uh, so as Ollie said, you know, the, the National Curriculum for Physical Education in England is, is not a, a big document. It's, it's quite a, a concise document, I think you'd say. And as we've looked at the, the curricula from across all of the, the different contexts, we, we see that that's actually quite a noticeable difference. Um, in terms of, of our policy. Um, but because it's so perhaps concise, what we tend to see is perhaps at times some narrow interpretations of that curriculum by practitioners. Um, and because of the perhaps the, 
the weight of some of that kind of performance discourse within the, the broader social structure, then sometimes we see that dominating. So it prioritizes perhaps that physical aspect of learning over some of the other um, domains of learning. Um, but that's not to say that those uh, learning outcomes aren't possible. And certainly there's a lot of support around for the view that, that physical education has the potential to promote wider learning and that holistic development. So thinking around things like social and emotional learning, character development, socio-moral development, and so on. But looking at the curriculum and perhaps because of the, the concise nature of it, perhaps these are a little more implicit within that document. So that leads us to ask questions perhaps around what are the implications of that? Are things less likely to be considered if they're not explicitly stated. And again, as, as Oli said, perhaps one of the implications within that is that if there are elements of practice that are more implicit, then there becomes much more of a reliance on practitioners having that knowledge or ability to read a curriculum in order to be able to interpret and enact that. Um, and one of the questions there is perhaps what learning opportunities are in place to support teachers' development in that respect. Um, and what happens, as we've seen over the last few months, when the context changes? How well prepared is a workforce to deal with a, a, a significant change in context and perhaps uh, a rereading of that, that policy document? Um, and as Oli said, in terms of uh, its current form, the National Curriculum uh, for Physical Education doesn't perhaps provide explicit guidance with regards to things like pedagogy and assessment as we see perhaps in some of those other curricula um, and that's in contrast uh, really to, to the, the new developments we've seen both within in Scotland and in Wales and that means that assessment can become problematic if there aren't benchmarks or, or things to go by um, and so we see perhaps the borrowing certainly within some aspects of of practice within England, of borrowing of assessment criteria from previous um, iterations or from perhaps uh, examinable forms of physical education. So um, in terms of provocations, uh, uh, we had five points I think that we, we really wanted to raise for you here. So um, just to keep you busy for the next half an hour, as Nicola said. Firstly, um, we can argue perhaps that the national curriculum for physical education in England is relatively concise and that perhaps it leaves a little too much to, if not the imagination, then the interpretation. So a key question perhaps is, what does such a short document say or not about the place and purpose of physical education within the curriculum? Secondly, uh, if we're thinking, is it time for change? then what can and should we perhaps learn from more recently developed curricula? Are there lessons that we can take um, to England from Scotland and Wales? Thirdly, in relation perhaps to this idea of development, uh, is and should health become a key focus within that? Are there any perhaps dangers or risks in that? And perhaps David um, alluded to some of those in, in the case of if we focus so much on health, what space is there for physical education. Uh, fourth question we had was, should we be looking to align home nations curriculum more, or is it a helpful thing to have differences between contexts to reflect um, the different cultures of those spaces? <laughs> um, and finally, uh, one question that we had uh, around uh, what prescription is best? What curricula do we perhaps need? a narrow rigid curriculum that outlines exactly what needs to be done or an approach that perhaps is more open and allows a little bit more for teacher agency or is there a middle ground? So those are questions for, for you and we'd be really interested to hear what you have to say in response to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. And thank you to all the panel for the points you raised in terms of the country context there, focusing more specifically today on Wales, England um, and Scotland and the provocations that you've offered um, to, uh, to go forward into the breakout rooms. 
Um, now, what I'm about to do is I'm about to put everybody into breakout rooms and there'll be of around four or five people and the panel members will be included in the breakout room. So that means um, you can, um, they'll be there. So they'll be part of that discussion, panel members. Um, so yes, yeah, so you'll be able to do that. Um, and if you want to panel members, if you can, you might want to, Andrew was just saying, you might want to perhaps post some of those provocations into the chat if you've got the opportunity to. If you've got them, you could cut, copy and paste them into the chat. Okay, so we'll spend around about 10 minutes or so in the breakout rooms and the aim of the breakout room is to come back into the main room with a question. We've already got some good questions coming up in the chat. So. If you can come back with a, a question, place it in the chat, and then I'll be able to cheer and put some questions forward to our panel. And we should have around about 20 minutes at least for discussion. Okay. Right, I will put everybody into breakout rooms now. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you again in about 10 minutes or so. Sorry, I've just had, I'm having a bit of a technical difficulty. Apologies. There we go. Apologies. That's breakout rooms open now. Hi, Dan, you've got your hand up. Oh, go on. So you can all join your breakout rooms. If you've got any problems joining breakout rooms, let me know. Andrew, Reese, Alice, are you able to join your breakout rooms? Alice, you having technical difficulties or? Questions, please place them in the chat. Um, so please put them in the chat that we can put forward to the group. I'm going to pick up on um, a question that we actually had earlier just to uh, get started. Um, and there's a question here from Liam asking about the Welsh proposals and a number of our students had the same question about questions around about um, the, the change in Wales and why that change, why physical education was not explicitly talked about in the Welsh curriculum 
And here, um, Liam's asking about how the Welsh proposals intend to safeguard against teacher misinterpretation of the curriculum. So how are our teachers being uh, placed within it? And a number of our students also asked about that idea of teacher voice in the curriculum. So I'll hand over to the panel, perhaps start with David and Anna, but we can then open it up more widely as well. I'm not shirking my responsibility, but I'm going to hand that one over to Anna. So that's a fabulous <laughs> question, Liam. <laughs> Okay, great. It's a really good question mm. there. So I guess, essentially, um, it depends for those who've got the educational eye and are from a PE background, I think that they're able to make some of these connections with PE quite explicit. I, my understanding is the reason why PE perhaps is not in there because of perhaps traditionally, not in all instances, but in some instances, for some young people, PE hasn't done perhaps what it was set out to achieve. So I believe, rightly or wrongly, I believe that's why the physical education wasn't um, sort of included in the first instance. But yet, for me, it is interesting that physical activity is explicit when they're within the curriculum. Sport has been brought in in the redrafted version, but again, physical education and movement so um, has been omitted. So I think that's interesting in itself. Um, if, if some schools, some people are pioneer schools, I think they would be, uh, they've been very much brought up in the system and they have a very good knowledge and understanding of the curriculum. Um, and therefore that they'd be able to see and make those connections. The concern is perhaps for those who weren't as involved and might be reading the curriculum superficially. Um, there are some professional learning uh, that, that's been developed. I guess some are trying to use, use teacher education as well. But there, I think it's a concern for us all that over the next two years, there is some large amount of professional learning that's needed in order to help frame and help people make those links to high quality PE uh, and high quality movement as well. Dave, I'm not sure if there's anything else you can... Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that. I think PE isn't the only discipline that's not in there. I think if you look in the other parts of the curriculum, you wouldn't see uh, chemistry or physics, for example. Uh, evident or explicitly evident. I think the reason for that, that there was a decision made that this, this new curriculum would be purpose driven as opposed to be disciplinary driven. So the disciplines are still there, but the purposes are more explicit. So, for example, our purpose in Wales is to produce over time um, healthy, confident individuals. So, you know, physical education, has, as I've put in the chat, has always done that. But the, there was a decision made in Welsh Government, um, based on other examples globally, that this would be a purpose-driven curriculum and then the role of disciplines would play a different role there. So I hope that kind of addresses that, adds to what Anna was saying there for you, Liam. I really love the one about teacher's voice because, um, as you'll know, in Scotland, teacher agency, teacher voice are very, very prominent subjects in how we then start to translate curriculum as well. Um, uh, and, and like with everything, I'll go back to Stephen Ball's work, there are possibilities for the curriculum if you have a, if you recognise what those possibilities are. So I'd probably say that there is huge opportunity for teachers' voice to become amplified through this process in ways that we haven't done in Wales before. Um, but Anna's point about how we do that is really, really important. So it's not just about the curriculum that's changing in Wales, how we start... Um, learning around curriculum, how we start thinking about health and well-being is a really crucial element. And so a lot of the work that we do at this moment in time, Anna and I are involved in, is actually working with teacher educators, as I say, to amplify their voice and give them the skills to read curriculum and design curriculum, as well as just practice physical education. But those are fabulous questions, Liam. Thank you. Thanks, David and Anna. And actually, I'd like to bring in Andrew at this point, because I think this is a key point that we made working with our students today around that linkage between what's happening and what's happened in Scotland and what's happening in Wales, because there are um, the people involved with Curriculum for Excellence have been involved in developing the curriculum in Wales, like Graham Donaldson, like Mark Priestley, and so we've seen some similarities in the curriculum and also perhaps some learning from mistakes. And perhaps, Andrew, that's where thinking about that, the teacher voice aspect for it and about teacher involvement in the development of curriculum, uh, perhaps we see that from a Scottish perspective. Andrew, do you want to come in? Because I know you've done some work around that. Uh, 
I will come in. Uh, it's quite a tricky thing. It, it's quite a complicated situation here because what we're seeing with the development of the curriculum in Wales with that purpose, you know, around those purposes, that's going to really, that will threaten a lot of teachers' views about uh, th their subjects and so on. Um, but it also does give a really good chance for that sort of disciplinary knowledge to be used in a way to fulfill the purposes of the curriculum. And so that the, the purposes of the curriculum then become the driver of the, the activities and, and the decision-making processes that, that the teachers can, can, uh, can engage with. Um, and if, they, if the opportunities are there to go back to first principles, because that was really the whole point of Curriculum for Excellence in Scotland, was that teachers to go back to first principles, really think about what would be a, the best way to provide the experiences for pupils that would give everybody the best opportunity to have meaningful outcomes so that everybody achieved their potential in education, rather than just saying, well, this is some stuff you need to learn, it's on the syllabus, and I'm going to tell it, I'm going to teach it to you, and if you haven't caught it, then it's partly not, partly my throwing of the information that might be a challenge, but it's also partly something to do with you, but at the end of the day, this is what this content is, and you haven't got it, and, and that way of viewing education um, is certainly, uh, you know, considered to be kind of, you know, moved away from uh, and we need to be you know uh, trying to address the needs for everybody but it is a it will be a real challenge as to what the other just as ollie talked about for england what is what else is in the policy context that teachers are referring to um and schools are interested in and what head teachers feel that they are responsible to or the local authorities because those um those key sort of checkpoints for quality assurance and for reporting have a huge impact on, on the account on how accountable teachers feel about what they want to do. They feel very accountable to their pupils, want to do a really good job for their pupils, but they're also mindful of what the, the school leadership team and, and others have in mind and parents and other stakeholders. So it's a so there's huge off affordances uh, in a period of, of curriculum making like this, but it's also understanding that in, in, in the context, and teachers are pretty skillful, they'll put together a curriculum that will work for their pupils in the context that they have. And, and you know, whether that fits what some policymaker thought at one point in time, it will always be subject to debate, I think. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And I think that leads on well to another one of the questions that we've got in the chat. So I've got a few questions here that I'm just um, lining up and trying to uh, have a, a seamless link through them. And I think I'm doing OK so far with this next one, which I'm actually going to put over to Ollie and Rachel first. Um, and Dylan saying, uh, Dylan Scanlon saying, we talking, they were talking about the different types of curricula across the context. So a broad curriculum or a narrow curriculum. And I know that working with our students, they picked up on that. They could see, for example, in England, as you stated, Ollie and Rachel, you know, there's not a lot of information there, whereas there seems to be more with the, within the Scottish and Welsh, Welsh curriculum documents. And Dylan says, we hear of the benefits and challenges of both, that the broad perhaps allows a bit more freedom for the teacher, but then the teacher can lack direction and the narrow curriculum can perhaps limit agency of the teacher. And Dylan's asking you, Rachel, you talked about the possibility of a middle ground. So what do you think that middle ground could look like or consist of? And he says, yes, I know it's a million dollar question, but <laughs> what, what do we think around that? Yeah, and that, 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 that is a big question. Um, interestingly, in our group, we talked about the idea of, um, so our big question that we were going to bring back was around structure and agency and how you manage that, that balance. Um, and I think that that is that middle ground and how you create a middle ground is perhaps to you know, perhaps have a, a, a structured framework with um, a range of options that, that can then be drawn on as additional sources of information. And one of the things that interested me um, around the Welsh uh, curriculum in the conversations that we'd had was this idea of, of case studies and using cases and, and having um, contexts uh, stories, if you like, narratives of how you interpret some of these principles and apply them within within practice. And I wonder whether that's um, a nice option to create a middle ground in that 
you start to be able to see how other people interpret a curriculum and apply it within a context and then um, are empowered, I guess, to, to then be able to look at what opportunities there are to do that within your own context. Um, but it's, it, is a, it is a big question. And I think the sometimes structure and having more structure is, is comfortable and having less does push you out of your comfort zone a bit. Um, but being out of your comfort zone with options to learn might be a nice way of creating perhaps a middle ground. I don't know, Ollie, would you add to, to that in any way? Yeah, um, I think there's been some really good points made about that and linking back to some of Andrew's um, previous comment. I think it is about striking that middle ground or finding that middle ground in this because if the curriculum is too loose or it doesn't provide enough guidance, there will inevitably be that variation and probably quite a lot of variation. But if it's too rigid or too stringent, what we find then is that it can't be shaped to that context. And I think that's something that, that Andrew picked up on, that idea that we need teachers to enact curriculum in ways that are relevant to their context, which will inevitably differ even within a single home nation, different contexts will require sort of slightly different readings, I think, from teachers. So we need to give them that scope to deliver in a way that's relevant to their context. Um, and also just to recognize their professional judgment, you know, teachers have trained to be professionals. We don't want them to just churn out rote lessons. We want them to be able to use that judgment and enact curriculum in creative and innovative ways. Um, and I think Rachel just alluded to that idea maybe of this is where maybe continuing professional development for teachers really comes in. Um, and it's something that probably is, is needed a little bit more, I'd argue, across probably all of the contexts to ensure that we don't just train teachers in IT and then send them out and, and whatever CPD they access is, is, is down to luck or chance. There needs to be more support to ensure there's that continued professional development and they can continue to learn to engage with those curricula in, in um, critical ways. I think in our discussion when we were in the breakout room, we spoke about, you know, how do you as a, as a new teacher go into a context with teachers that are seasoned professionals who are maybe a little bit stuck in their ways? How do you go in as that critical scholar and try and navigate your way around that and innovate practice? We need to ensure that we don't just leave people out in practice. We also try and keep them connected and continue developing, I think. Yeah, I think a really good point there, um, Ollie, about professional development. And I think that's Andrew will agree with me here that, that was a big part of what was missing for curriculum for excellence in the implementation and possibly moving forwards now with its second OECD review part of its uh, potential undoing. But obviously, I think having talked to David and Anne in a Welsh context, we was learning from that and trying to take that forward. I'm going to change the focus of the discussion a bit more back onto that health and physical education aspect. And there's a good question here from Jake Cameron. And this is a good point that the um, we talked about with the student, with our students um, looking at this as well, about the role of physical education within health and what what should we be looking at and what is our responsibilities? And um, Jake's saying that, you know, given the current focus on obesity epidemic, physical inactivity, that is PE, not the sole purpose of PE to look at that, but perhaps part of the PE curriculum should be to look at aspects around that, perhaps looking at nutrition, these different aspects, um, so that we're looking at that, working with pupils to maintain that, that health in not just physical, but in a holistic sense, but then Jake's saying, but the, the focus seems to be on improving performance. So how does that sit with pursuing a healthy and active lifestyle if there's such a focus on performance within the curriculum? Um, and I'll just open that up to the panel. Who wants to go first? Who wants to unmute their mic <laughs> and answer that one? Shall I go just to start off briefly? Yeah, thanks, Ollie, yeah. I guess my question back would be, are PE teachers equipped to teach health? And I think certainly in that English context, to some extent, I'd argue we don't equip them that. They don't train in health necessarily. We just assume that there are these connections between physical activity, PE and health. Therefore, PE teachers can teach health. And I think it's a little more complex than that. And that's where these performative discourses around health and the body sort of find their way into practice. If we look over to Australia and New Zealand, over there we have health and physical education, HP, which is a much more... Um, rounded sort of subject area and curriculum. Um, so I guess it's a question for us as to whether or not we need to re redefine our curriculum. Should we focus more and have health and physical education? And I can see David might follow up on that. Yeah, it's, it's uncanny, that question, Jake, because I'm 
uh, preparing some lectures next week using uh, Mikael Quintentet. Quintentet. <laughs> right there, all right. He's not okay. here. It's okay. <laughs> Dodgy one. I will put his name in the chat for you, Jake. Um, uh, he makes it, it's a brilliant paper, by the way. So I, I would have that on ITE courses if we're talking about health and physical education. Uh, the, the question for me comes down to what do we see health as being, even before we start thinking about curriculum? So, you know, do we as a nation in Wales want to see health and well being from a kind of instrumental perspective where we are telling people to stop things like you know stop or, or do things like do more physical activity and uh, stop smoking do we want that kind of instrumental approach to health or do we when we're starting to think and make having conversations around health want to take an educative stance in which we start asking questions around why do we start why do people choose not to do physical activity or why people can't do physical activity and how do we start um, allowing them the opportunities to do that? So linked to Ollie's point, I really, it really comes down to what kind of position do you want to take on health and wellbeing uh, even before you start designing your curriculum? And I think that's a um, contested issue across all nations as well. Um, and I think we need to give yeah, students the choice in that. And I think just to come back to the chat here, um, Dave, there's a good point raised from Holly Cannon saying that, you know, with the neoliberalism aspects, such as um, helping to develop a healthy nation, preparing people for life and work and performativity, it's, she's saying, you know, it's ensuring that simplistic, like you're saying there, you know, that simplistic healthism discourse is not, it's not simplistically, it's, it's actually thinking about the more complex aspects around that. So. Um, yeah, good to see that coming up in the chat as well, definitely. I'm aware of time and we've only got a couple of minutes left. I just want to go back to a question actually from earlier and relating to um, what, Ra um, what Rachel was saying as well. So we've had this panel looking at different the curriculum from different country perspectives. And um, what should we be? Um, Dan Curtis asked about so many see the curriculum differently. Should we be ensuring some kind of common standard or is it good that we've got difference across the nation? So I'm going to, a quick final kind of round up from each of you in relation to that, if we think about what this means um, across the board. Who'd like to go first? I, I don't mind saying something. Thanks, um, and, then, and then people with more qualifications can go after me. <laughs> um, I, I think that it is important, we had again this discussion in our group that there is, uh, a context specific element to a curriculum and I think that's a valuable element to developing um, a policy that fits uh, a context um, but there also needs to be shared conversations in terms of uh, aligning with with other policies and, and having those conversations to see what we can learn from each other um, in the sense that there are elements that are, that go across contexts. So it's been interesting having this this sort of research project element sort of say, yes, we recognize these elements are, are different and necessarily so, but having conversation and, and talking about why they are different and in what ways you might be able to learn from that is important. Thanks, Rachel. My, my point. I think just to add to that as well, I guess, since devolution, we do have different education systems within, you know, each of the nations. So it's much broader than just physical education. Um, and I think sometimes perhaps these conversations are really, really useful because sometimes we ultimately are working towards the same thing, but we're just using different languages and discourses depending on the culture and the context in order to achieve that. So I think ultimately for me, it's the learning that takes place through these discussions and then we think, okay, how can we learn then and perhaps, oh, let's take something that works really well there, that might work for us in our context as well. That's ultimately the most important thing. Okay. Thanks, Anna. Anyone want to come in next? I think I'd just agree with what's been said already in terms of this idea that, you know, what policy and curriculum are context specific. And I think it's important that we have that. But for too long, perhaps we've worked in silos with these curricula and there's an awful lot of good practice we can learn from others. So we need this dialogue and we need to see what policy we can borrow to usefully inform our own curriculum, and our own practice moving forward. So conversations like this are important, especially from sort of pre-service teachers all the way through to practicing yeah, thank you. Anyone else? 
Can I just come in? I mean, I think one of the we it's not uh hang on, get my thoughts in a row. It's really understandable that we want to have uh, a coherent and cohesive approach. And because if you've got one school where pupils are getting a certain educational provision and five miles away or 10 miles away or 50 miles away, they're getting something entirely different, then people can be rightly concerned about that because you know that's public education, it's been funded and is a level of provision that people might want to expect. But to, you have to allow for, so. But, but doing the same thing in every situation is, is not the right way to go because you know we look for consistency in custard but we don't need that type of consistency in the curriculum we can have things that uh, meet and, and fit with with what's going on but when it comes to something like uh, as something as complicated as health and, and health and well-being I mean you know in one respect health is something we might be able to pin down to some respect to, to, to when we then bring in well-being actually I'm, I'm going to challenge this view that was put forward about you know an obesity epidemic it's not really showing that in Scotland you know that we, we do we are concerned about ill health we are concerned about obesity but you know, if you look at the the current uh, data that's being collected it's it's not great news it's running at 20 about 29 percent of all uh, people across all ages are obese at the moment but in 2008 27% of all people were obese so it's not moving in a direction that we uh, that we'd be happy about but also not to be too concerned about it either there's other things that could be far more damaging to your health than being a bit overweight um, so we it, it is a real challenge and for physical education if we can move beyond just seeing physical education about physical activity, getting the pupils into lessons and getting running for 60 minutes, that's really good news because, you know, we want our physical education curriculum to be inclusive so that everybody can experience uh, all of all the learning opportunities that are there for physical education. So long as the curriculum that is provided in schools gives and affords those opportunities, that's surely good news. And that's the sort of direction we'd like to go to go in, I'd hope. Thank you, Andrew. And I'm going to thank the rest of the panel right there because I'm aware of time. So I'd really like to say a big thank you to David Aljuice, Anna Bryan, Ollie Hooper, Rachel Sanford and Andrew Horrell for being our panel today. A big thank you to everybody who has come in as our audience today. I think we had nearly 100 people in total taking part, so great to see that. I think this is possibly something we would want to do again. And certainly this is something that um, CIRA, the Scottish Education Research Association, supports. And this was run as one of our CIRA Connects events which are online events that we hold on a monthly basis and that are free for you to access. But if you're interested in finding out any more about um, CIRA and its work, please go to our website um, and you can find out more about joining CIRA as well there as our various member benefits to being a part of the Scottish Educational Research Association. We have our conference events coming up online in November and we look forward to that. And a final thank you to everybody uh, for taking part today. If the panel just want to hang on so I can say goodbye to them and everybody else, you can leave. Have a lovely evening. Um, thank you for taking part. Bye.